Welcome, friends, to the Someone Gets Me podcast. I am your host, Diane Allen, and I am so delighted that you're here. This podcast was created because I believe there is a visionary leader inside each one of us who is waiting to be seen. In each episode of Someone Gets Me, you will hear useful tips from successful visionaries who will share their stories about how being seen has allowed them to take their vision out into the world with action. The diverse life of a musician with my good friend, Chuck Kentis. You guys are in for a treat today, boy. So get ready for this interview. I met Chuck some time ago and you know how like when you meet somebody, you just know you got to know them? Well, that's what happened. My introverted self took a while to ask him to be on the show because I was nervous that he'd say no, but I was wrong. He said yes, generously. So Chuck, thank you for being on the show. And I know that you have some cool stories. And I also know that you're very inspiring. You inspire me every time I talk to you. So I'm excited to see where this conversation goes today. And I want to welcome you to Someone Gets Me. Thank you, Diane. It's a pleasure being here. I'm very glad you asked, and uh, I appreciate the compliment of uh, being uh, inspiring. I I, I just uh, try to be myself, and uh, you know, as as we get older, it's kind of like I mean, you know, I really don't have a, a care about what people think of me or when or or I have no pride and no shame. I'll tell you that. Uh, and that that uh, that continued through throughout my musical career, <laughs> I'd say. Right, and your musical co- career continues. And the thing that I love about your musical career, which I'm going to have you give us a little flavor of it here in a moment. One of the things I love about it is the diversity and how things kept changing and growing and evolving as you kept saying yes to different opportunities throughout your lifetime. I mean, like you started playing when you were five, right? And so that means that you've been in this world longer than a lot of people have been alive. Just really cool. And you do composing and you do sound design, you do lots of things. So give us a little snippet on how did this all start? Like, was your family, were they all musicians? Cause you started so young or how did that all work? My family weren't musicians. My dad was, loved, uh, uh, country Western music, like real country Western. He had a harmonica that he used to play. And I remember, my grandfather also had a harmonica. So when I went there, he'd always play harmonica. And I just found out recently, which I didn't know, my aunt, I, I just documented uh, my family history with her. Uh, she's like 90 because she knows all the story. But they at one time had a piano and he played violin, which I never, never knew that. But the story from my mom goes when I was like three, we lived in uh, Lake Persephone, New Jersey, and uh, the neighbors next door had a piano. And... Uh, my mom came over one day and she's listening. She's saying, who's playing the piano in there? She goes, that's your son. <laughs> he goes, he would come in. I would come in, like not even knock on the door. I'd walk in there and hi and go and play. And they'd let me play. And I'd like pick out. She told me, she goes, you, you pick out themes from TV shows, you know? Wow. So, yeah. So I started. The, and then what happened was we moved into a house in uh, East Patterson and, uh, there was a piano in the basement already, and, and the, the people who, who lived there were trying to move it out, the stairs of the basement, and the thing went down into the wall, like crashed in the wall. So they said, we're leaving this here. So we actually moved into a house that had a piano. So my mom started, uh, uh, got me piano lessons, which, you know, wasn't something I really wanted to do. I love playing, but uh, but the teacher started teaching me piano and theory. You know, which I'm so glad that I learned. And my mom used to say, because she'd make me practice, my mom, someday you're going to thank me for this. <laughs> and um, so I, I started playing trombone in high school, uh, not in high school, third grade. And uh, so I kind of played that through throughout uh, going into uh, junior high and stuff. But I, I didn't want to become like a classical pianist or anything like that. And around 12 or 13, I started just uh playing you know composing like just playing things that i would uh like to play you know and wound up uh performing one of my pieces in eighth grade or something like that at a at a you know band concert and everything like that so that's where i kind of like really took up the love of it again and uh but i didn't i wanted to compose and I, we actually found a uh a resident composer in patterson richard lane 
was actually recorded. He's, he's uh, records and stuff of his pieces. So I was taking composition with him, you know, beginning of high school and all that. And uh, I actually started when, when, I, when I was playing in band in high school, it was, you know, they had marching band, concert band, jazz band. I said, how come we don't have a rock band? So I, I formed a rock band, for high school rock band, the first high school rock band. And uh, all, the, all the guys that I picked were all seniors, you know. So uh, they left, you know, after my first year. But they said, hey, you know, we're, they started playing bars and clubs and stuff. They said, hey, you want to join this band? I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit underage, you know. So, well, we'll get your fake ID. Don't worry about it. So they got me fake ID. started working nightclubs and stuff in high school through high school. And then my friend, I had a friend of mine who was also a pianist, but he was classical pianist. He played Chopin and everything. And there was a little room that had a really nice uh, Kawhi Grand in there. And we used to kind of like take turns playing and stuff. And and we were friends, but we were always kind of like battling. You know, he liked romantic. I liked Baroque, you know, and we would kind of (laughs) battle between those two. He's like, Baroque is so boring. And I'm like, well, it's mathematical, you know. And uh, and, uh, anyway, so he, he wound up uh, going to summer school in his junior year and he, he graduated. So he, he graduated early, wound up enrolling in uh, Jer- Jersey City State College for music uh, a year early. So I was like, damn. You know, so my senior year, I, uh, I had got enough uh, scholarship points, whatever, to that I only need to take two classes in the morning. So I went over to Jersey City State. And I said, hey, I'm still in high school, but can I can I uh, apply to take some classes here, music class? And I said, well, just get a note from your counselor. <laughs> so I went and got my counselor. He got got me a note, and uh, I started going up, you know, taking classes there in the afternoon and evenings at Manor's, uh, not Jersey City State. And uh, there, they didn't have uh, you couldn't major in composition there. So I said, oh boy. So I went. I found uh, I don't know what <laughs> where I got the nerve to do these things. <laughs> I went to Manus College of Music in New York City and talked to the dean there. And the same thing, I said, look, I'm still in high school, but I would love to, you know, study here. And he says, yeah, I'll give, I'll give you a composition lessons. And I was taking composition from him. He assigned me an intern, a uh, student teacher at the school to teach me like uh, ear training and counterpoint and things like that. And uh, then that all came to a drastic end when I joined the glam rock rock band <laughs> and started working there was a scene in north jersey that was there were so many bands and so many places to play i I, like in within say 10 mile radius of where i lived in patterson there must have been 20 bars and clubs that had live music and each one of those had between two to four bands a night and this was seven nights a week you know you can go and and some bands would get like every monday here every tuesday there every wednesday there so there were like hundreds of bands that were working and making money and guys would, and I was able to play five, and they were long hours. You would start at nine and go to two. So you play five sets. You play like 45 minutes on 10 minutes off. And uh, so you were playing, you know, five nights a week, you were playing like six mm-hmm. hours a night. You had to get better, you know, as a musician. Right. And, and, and also you're getting paid. It was like, we were in, we, you know, I'm fresh out of high school and I'm like, no, I was still senior when I was doing that. So, you know, I was making decent money and, uh, and traveling and stuff. And, and, uh, it, it, um, yeah. So, so I did that and I did a few other bands and in New York in the seventies was really cool. Cause they had this, uh, I saw in like, I think it was a village voice. They had this music registry, you know, and, and I went down there and for like $10, they put your name on a list, you know, anybody looking for a keyboard player, anybody looking for a guitar player and stuff. And they call this registry and say, well, here's this guy, this guy, this guy, you know, and I just get called for auditions and I go in and do that, you know, and I wound up getting, you know, big gigs, you know, go on the road, go, you know, national tours, international tours and stuff. And uh, so I started doing that and uh, I wound up, uh, auditioning for a band in New York uh, with Carmine Rojas, who was, he was, uh, he had just done Let's Dance with David Bowie's record. And he was going to go out with Bowie, you know, on that tour. And he had done, he was in LaBelle. And uh, and then, so when LaBelle broke up, you had Patti LaBelle, Sarah Dash, and Nona Hendricks. Nona Hendricks went on her own as solo artist. So we started, I started playing with her through Carmine. 
and touring with her. And that's kind of like where I learned. And, and uh, well, I had learned funk before because I was in a band down in Philadelphia. Uh, when I, li I lived down in Philly for a couple of years, I played with this all black band called Bittersweet. I used to play all the nightclubs and stuff. And it was all funk, you know, that 70s okay. funk and stuff. Yeah. So I got with Nona. I knew how to do that, you know. And I was playing with the other keyboard player was Bernie Worrell, who was uh, with Talking Heads. And he was also, he did all the synth lines for Funkadelic, you know flashlight and all those songs and stuff so and i used to room with him and this guy was a child prodigy i mean he was you know he played for symphonies when he was 12 down in washington and stuff real sweetheart guy but just a one of those guys who who was always kind of like i don't know charlie brown or something because we do these rehearsals in new york and his car would get towed every day you know and we all felt bad for him but like oh, i don't know so i didn't own him and uh and then with carmine we, I got with uh, uh, John Waite and I did a record with him. And then we got a call to do Julian Lennon's first tour. Uh, and uh, that was through uh, Phil Ramone. You said you work with Billy. Did you know Phil? Phil no. Ramone, the producer? Okay. No. So we're doing Julian's first tour. And uh, we go in and this kid, he, he had no idea of anything like as far as live performance, you know. Right. It just done a lot. And I had, it, had that hit out. And uh, he was like, well, how do we hear ourselves on stage? And, you know, we're kind of like walking him through it. But this kid had perfect intonation, you know, when he would sing, it would be dead on, you know, no, mm -hmm. you know, it was like, and I sang backup. So it was like a really cool thing to sing with him. And we did a couple of Beatles songs, but the, the thing that really got me was like, I think it was the first day we went in and we're checking out the PA. He started singing Twist and Shout. And it sounded yeah. like his dad. I mean, it was like. <laughs> Harry, you know, you know, he did that that part, and he sounds just like his dad. So that was like spooky, you know. Wow, but yeah. It was uh, you know, it was it was crazy. His first tour was all sold out. And everybody, you know, wanted to, uh, you know, be, you know, because of his dad, you know, right. what he sounded like, and he had to he had to conquer that, you know, he had to get past that, and that's hard for somebody that young, I think, mm -hmm. to you know to have to live up to that kind of thing you know and uh so yeah that was interesting um you know and then gigs just came in and you know, we had, i was doing julian and, and john taylor from duran duran saw a gig and he asked me to do uh uh the power station mm -hmm. with uh that was with uh the two duran guys andy and john tony thompson from chic and uh uh robert palmer was a singer for, on the record but he didn't want to go on the road so they used michael debar and i uh, we did Live Aid in 1985 at the, in Philadelphia, and that was that was pretty cool. And then uh, Tony did uh, was working with Bernard Edwards, who was producing one of Rod's records, Out of Order. Tony was the drummer, and Rod wanted a new band, and 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 suggested me to play keyboard. So I flew in with Carmine. Uh, we had just finished. We were just finishing a tour with a, a, a British artist, Baluey Sun. We finished the last day and we flew out to California to LA to do the auditions. And uh, I that night after the audition, I went back to the hotel. I actually prayed. I said, hey, look, if I'm supposed to have this, give it to me. But if I'm not supposed to have this, don't let me have this. I understand, you know, and I was I was really praying for, for you know, God's will on that. Right, right. Uh, uh, you know, it was, it was a, it was a weird time for me. So, uh, I, I didn't, I wasn't sure if I should take this or not. And I wound up doing it. And, uh, I, that was in April of 88. And I did that up until like four years, 2017, right after wow. that. So I was with him for about 30 years. Doing right. That. So the Rod you're talking about is Rod Stewart. Rod Stewart. Yes. Yes. Okay, uh, just clearing that up for the listeners. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. But right. I have to, I have to stop for a second, and I have to tell you a funny story that just popped yeah. in my mind <laughs> when you mentioned Duran Duran. Okay. Because first of all, I love their music, but I, you just brought back the fun, the coolest like vision in my head when they were really big. I had a parrot, a yellow Nate parrot. His name was Jeffrey, and whenever I would play Duran Duran, he would sing with them. He wouldn't sing with anybody else you know no matter what music i was playing or whatever and he would ooh, and he would sing with them and so i used to turn on duran duran just to listen to my bird sing and i haven't had that memory in so long and it's such a fond memory i'm like oh my god 
It's like so cool. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> what an interesting, like weird kind of intersection, you know, but I just. Sing along with the songs. That's incredible. Yeah, it was great. And, and he would sing along with them. And I'm like, and so he must have heard it from me enough times to learn it, obviously. Really? And I'm, but I really loved it. I loved their music. So I'd sing it a lot. And so he used to sing along. And when he said that, I'm like, oh, I forgot. Jeffrey used to sing to Duran Duran. <laughs> that's so See, music, so, music just transcends everything. <laughs> it does. It does. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, it's funny how it can really uh, trigger memories. And, and I think that's the thing with, uh, you know, especially with playing with Rod is because of, uh, I remember like when I first heard Maggie May, I was in a, a, a Volkswagen VW. I was, a, I was like a freshman or something. I was in with a senior, the senior girl clarinet player and we were drinking Boone's Farm apple wine, you oh know, my. but I remember that vividly, you know, I can right. remember it on the radio. So it does. And so like when we do those shows, it's like, you know, the, all those, the people in the audience are kind of going back to those places when they heard those songs, you know, and that's why so many people love the, you know, these legendary acts, you know, you just mentioned Billy Joel and, you know, Paul McCartney and this, you know, all those people that we grew up with in the seventies, eighties, whatever. Right. Like career. James Taylor, Kenny Loggins, all of them, they have these yeah. acts and these songs that take us, transport us right to that time and space. Right. Right. We're, anch we're anchored there, you know? And in fact, I was at Disney one time and, um, Oh, who was it? The village people were playing and only, only one of them is the original. Right. And quite frankly, it was awful. Right. <laughs> but everybody in the crowd was standing and hooping and hollering. And I looked at my friend and he looked at me and I said, they're just living in their memory. Yeah. They're not really hearing mm -hmm. it. They're hearing what's in their mind of it. And they're having a blast and enjoying it. So bless everybody. That's really great. Mm -hmm. There were some moments where my friend and I are like, are we missing something? You know, because it, it was <laughs> not great at all. Yep. Watching the crowd live in their memory. Now yes. that made it entertaining. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. I, I have very good friends of mine whose oldest daughter, her name is Maggie May. Oh, yeah. There's hundreds of those that, that right. come. Yeah. You know, yeah. do they have your kids after that? After, uh, after uh, you know, a lot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, you, so you get that. Yeah. Side note, one of my closet, one of my skeletons in the closet is I did the Village People's first tour. And in 1978, before they, you know, this was before they even got big, we were playing discos and then Macho Man came up. So within a year, I was we're playing like these discotheques. Uh, within eight months, we were uh, playing, I did two night, two sold out nights in Madison Square Garden with them, you know, and it got just blew up incredibly, you know, and I went, I toured uh, Japan, Australia, and, you know, I backed up, there were a bunch of acts that were also uh, on the same management, the Ritchie family and, and Felicia Rashad was Felicia, the girl, the woman from uh, the Cosby show. She mm -hmm. was Felicia Rashad at the time. She was a singer. She was doing Josephine Baker stuff. So let's talk about varied. <laughs> wow. Wow. But that kept you interested, right? Well, you know, it was my first big international tour, you know, I hadn't, you know, so, you know, I was going, I went to, you know, it was 20, 21, and the band I was with from Philly, Bittersweet, they were, we were all like 19 years old and stuff. And, you know, we were going, we were playing, we were in Japan for like a month, you know, playing through uh, all these places. And, and it was, it was, you know, so many experiences I had was, a, so this is 78. We went to, we were playing Hiroshima and went down to the A-bomb dome, which is the memorial for the atomic bomb. So this is only 30 years after the, you know, right. after, after that happened. And so we go there and, and we're just standing out. I mean, I'm six foot, everybody else in the band is like six, four, you know, and these Japanese people, they'd be terrified when they see us. I remember in hotels, we'd on the elevator, the doors would open. And the last thing you expect to see is, is like a, is, is an elevator with like, you know, seven black guys who were like six, four, they thought it was either a basketball team or they, you know, this look right. of confusion would just come over them. <laughs> and, and so anyway, we're at the, we're at the A-bomb uh, Memorial and it's, and I don't, there's no tourists. There. There's no, like, you know, it's all school kids, mm -hmm. you know, Japanese little school kids going through this and seeing this horrific tragedy, you know, 
and seeing us and looking at us and, and you know, th- these are Americans. These are, you know, and, and so, well, so it was, um, you know, it was, it, it was emotionally confusing, you know, those right. type of things, but they're real, you know, and they're real. And, 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 you know, when I tour, I, 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 you know, we go, we go to those things. Roger, really big history buff. And, and, uh, we were, we played in uh, Poland and we all went down to, uh, Auschwitz and saw that. And, uh, you know, you, you can see the beauty in humanity and the beauty in the world. And, but you also have to be reminded of the, the absolute horrific things that man is capable of, you know, yeah. And because you got to remind yourself that that's, that's, you know, that those things happen and, uh, they can happen again. And, you know, and, 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 uh, so, so it's, uh, uh, I think it's part, a good part, a good thing for me personally to experience those things, you know? because it, it, it kind of rounds me out, you know, uh, right. there, there's a, right. you know, as far as you're talking about diversity and stuff like that, you know, I was very, I can, for me, I was kind of chameleon. Like I could go and play like these real punk clubs in Philly and New York and the Lower East Side and stuff like that. And then wind up, you know, doing white tie affairs. <laughs> and, stuff, you know? and uh, so, but that's the musician is kind of becomes a, for me, it kind of becomes almost like a character, you know, and that's the way I can get over. Uh, like I said, I've got no shame and no, uh, no pride. I can, you know, I'll do anything on stage. And, uh, but, I, but it's, you know, I almost, it's not really me almost, you know, it's kind of right. me hidden underneath, but portraying, you know, this character outside that, you know, that's as far as like performance goes, you know? So uh, I, I love that part of it. And I kind of miss that, but, you know, I kind of learned that early on playing in uh glam bands in the 70s you know playing you know bowie and band you know we right things yeah so i don't know where that's going <laughs> i don't either so i want um and you're in the guinness book of world records well i uh brought is but i was there and what, what happened is but you were there you, so that I means you're there too and, and uh actually my picture's in it with, with i'm playing on stage with him and uh uh i think that's hilarious uh we played <laughs> We've had the world's largest free concert audience, the, the largest audience. So we, we played, it was uh, December 31st, 1994 uh, in Rio de Janeiro on Copacabana Beach. So we played, you know, and the beach had, I remember driving and they had what they called delay towers set up like for miles. So you'd have like screens with speaker systems and then you'd have screen. And what they'd have to do is delay it because sound is, you know, doesn't travel that fast. So the sound of the stage, by the time it gets to a person who say, you know, 500 yards away, it's going to be, you know, so they have to delay that sound there in order for it to be in sync. Right. So, technically. Anyway, but so, you know, they estimated that night was like 3.5 million, you know, which, I, I, you know, it's just unfathomable. But anyway, that's the free, con- and, and nobody's broken it yet. The Stones try to do it down there, but I think you only got 1.5 million. So that's my my big claim to fame having a <laughs> book. I just think it's hilarious. Yeah. You know? right. My kids, my grandkids and stuff look and it's like, oh my goodness, you know, what was that? <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, it's one of those things that it's like it's fun and powerful and cool all at the same time. And like who would figure? Like, I know when you were in high school, you weren't thinking, let me see how can I get in the Guinness Book of World Records, were you? It's goofy, uh, goofy, like, you know, just <laughs> it happens, you know, and, and the thing is with life, it's like you can have that happen and then you could have, you know, and then there's real disasters that happen, you know, too. You know, you can get lucky in one way and get uh, far unlucky in another way, you know, but those are circumstances that you would never dream of happening that do happen, you know, and it happens to a lot of people, unfortunately, you know. And, right. Uh, you know, so they, you got both ends of that. You know, oh, and I think the, t- the important thing is to have a have a faith that kind of carries you through that, you know, where right. you're grateful for the for the things that, you know, are nice, you know. But then when the other side happens, uh, it's kind of trying to make use of it, uh, try to make it turn it into something positive that becomes, right. your, you know. Right, exactly, because you can learn how to have faith and be grateful in the face of things that aren't so great and grateful for the things that are great. And know that overall, there's some 
everything works together for the good in some right. cool way. So how did you handle not being understood by people who didn't get it through your lifetime? Like, how do you handle that when people just look and they like, they don't get it? I, you know, I just kind of, I, you know, I don't know if I ignored it, but I, I, I kind of gravitated toward the more toward people who did get me, you know? So like in high school, I didn't hang out with, with anybody. It was like, you know, I had the one musician friend who actually got out early and then all my friends were, were, had graduated and they were, they were all musicians. So I, I usually hung out with guys that were, you know, way older than me. And, uh, uh but, uh, yeah, yeah, no. So it's a, that's a good question. I, I really didn't, I didn't, uh, take it to heart. You know, sometimes you would get, I guess, disappointed, you know, that, you know, especially like musically, you're doing something music. Cause I, I always tried to think out of the box and do things, you know, way, you know, just kind of away from center, you know? Right. And, uh, so that's not going to, that's not going to click with the majority of people, you know? And uh, I had to come to understand that, that that's, well, that's why it is off center because it's not, you know, people don't, you know, they, right. people like things a certain way or music a certain way, you know, very straightforward. And, uh, and then you have stuff on the outside and I, and I, you know, I didn't, I, I'd sacrifice that. So in, instead of going for the accolades of doing, you know, musically something that was, you know, this is apart from my work, you know, I was, I was a side man, you know, so a lot of that stuff was just, I was just hired as a, as a, you know, as a side man to do the, those gigs. And, uh, but for my stuff, so I, I would, uh, I like to go slightly left, but, and then understand like, you know, and not be bitter about it or not be judgmental of people or anything like that, you know, and just, well, this is what they want to do. This is where I'd like to take it. It's just in me that, that, uh, you know, I can do the, the straight ahead thing. And I did, and I did that for, a, for, you know, composing wise as well. Uh, I did a lot of, a lot of production music back in the nineties. So that production music is, uh, there's companies that, that, um, uh, that offer music to like sports stations, TV shows, reality show, you know, it's like put in music or the background music or what have you. And, and so, you know, my assignments would be to do things, uh, I do do a bunch of things that sound like 80s, you know, radio music, you know, or do some like uh, beat swing, you know, or or, uh, um, you know, uh, um, energetic, you know, sports kind of themes and stuff. And I did a lot. And what I would do is while I was on the road, I'd have like a studio. I'd take like a small recording setup in in my room and I would do those at night after shows. So it's kind of like doing two jobs at once. And then I started working with our drummer, David Palmer, and we, we started writing for, uh, you know, some TV shows we did and some TV commercials and things like that. So that kind of thing, you know, you're, you're, you're like asked to do a certain thing. And, and so you compose straight up the middle or, you you know, you do what they want as opposed right. to what I want. You know, it's kind of like they're the they're the and a lot of composers get like kind of twisted about that, you know, because it, it, it's hard when you're writing something, you kind of comes a personal part of you, it becomes a uh, comes part of you. So when people reject it, you feel like they're rejecting you, you know, and you get you get personalized at it. Right, but, uh, right. You have to disconnect it and say, no, this is, uh, you know, this is this. Here you go. And uh, what, what can you change? Can you change this and change that? And, and yeah, you know, like TV people, it's like, you know, you make like 10, 15 changes, you know, so you got to get a tough skin. You got to have a tough skin. <laughs> right. Right. Cause they're yeah. looking for something specific and they don't even really tell you what it is probably completely until they start hearing it and go, well, what about this? Or what about that? And, and they don't know what it is. Sometimes they can't, right. explain. most of these people are not musical in sense. So, so they're trying to describe it in a, in a certain like right. in categories, colors or something like that. But the pro and then you've got like three people that are, that you're trying to please at the same <laughs> time that nah, forget it. You know, it's like, we're on for weeks on this before somebody decides what they want. <laughs> right. And, and can even identify what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but so doing that was, you know, it's, it's fine. And it, and it, uh, they were nice niches to be in uh, at the time, you know, it seemed like it's, it, you know, it seemed like for me, every, my career was like, you know, I hit the, I hit those points where we're at the right time for some reason, you know, like touring, uh, in the in the 80s, 70s and 80s and stuff like that was a lot of fun. It was really crazy and stuff. And um, 
uh, now it's really difficult. You know, I know a lot of my friends were on the road and, and with the COVID and just the business in general and the whole, the whole music industry really changed a lot, you know, going into the nineties, two thousands. And, uh, you know, you kind of got to swing with it, you know, it's like, uh, you know, music, when I started in the seventies and eighties, I'm sure there were people in the forties and fifties were like, damn, what is this? You know, they're playing, <laughs> you know, right, right. Some big band and they're like, man, well, you know, not working. What the hell is going on here? You know, it, all through that, it changed. But I was at a good time because I, I, I was able to pl I played like five nights a week all the time. You know, you played and got paid. You know, it's great. So you were, uh, so you were like in heaven, living, living this like dream reality of all these really cool things because you kept saying yes along the way. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it, was, it wasn't always, you didn't feel like it was a dream. You know, I didn't always love like, you know, I mean, there was, it was hard. I yeah. mean, I, I had back then now, like, you know, people play, they bring their computer and they hook it up to that. I had an electric piano that was like 88 keys, two pieces. Each piece weighed probably 90 pounds. Right. And, yes. uh, I would carry that damn thing up two flights of stairs to a second floor apartment by myself, like, you know, every other night. I mean, it was work, you know, like it, physical hard work. Right. It was physically hard. And then there was all the travel that takes a toll on you. There was a lot to it. And, and it's funny because I've been on tour and I know that it's hard. And I can only imagine extrapolating that over decades and decades and decades and decades. I, you know, like I don't have decades of experience, but I have enough. I have a taste of enough to extrapolate it and go, oh, this is way harder. And what goes in behind the scenes for the show, for the concert that we all go to, and like people my age have what I call mid '70s syndrome. You give us a '70s, a band that's big in the '70s, or music from the '70s that's big, and we all like jump right to that time frame. We're there, singing, dancing, running around, and we will go see tribute bands for those people and those people until they're not here anymore because of the memory and the connection. And I always say, and they played real instruments. Oh, yeah. And no. sang real song. I mean, they were really singing. Like, yep. And there's an appreciation of that. And my mom was a concert pianist. She did um, a lot of classical. But my parents taught me about jazz. Like, my first music that I loved was jazz and scat and stuff like that. Like, really into it. And when we were on a tour, one a sailing tour, we were in Toronto. And we spent one of the nights... Now, I'm like 16-ish, somewhere in there. And I wasn't drinking age yet, I know that. And we went into all these bars, all these like hole-in-the-wall jazz club, dark, cool spots. And my mom would teach us all the different cool jazz things, like about this bass player or that thing or this thing, like because she was a genius. And I learned to just love jazz. I still do love it. And... And music, like high quality, good music, like people who like get get the math, they get the talent, they get the precision, they like get it. There's a difference between that and other kinds of music, though I love them too. So what, what the, I, who were the jazz people that you liked? Oh, I loved um, Herbie Hancock. Yeah, yeah. I loved, oh, what was his name? Chuck Mangione, I love. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. All kinds of like that. It's funny you mentioned Toronto. You you were you were listening to jazz up there. Mm -hmm. we, went to, we went to some street. I don't remember where it was, yeah. but my mom was all excited for us to go to all these jazz clubs because she was educating us on that culture of the small little jazz club. And we went from club to club like we spent. I bet we went. It seemed like a hundred, but it couldn't have been that many. It was probably like six or seven. I was too younger. I, I was loving it. But didn't know, and there was this place in, in St. Pete, we were living in Sarasota at the time, that had jazz, like, downstairs. And we would, my parents would go, and my brother and I would listen as long as we could. And then we'd go play on the beach and come back and listen some more. But we really were indoctrinated into the whole jazz scene from the time we were very small children. And, and I'm glad. I'm glad about that because I have a great appreciation for high-quality music and different kinds of music. And I love it all. Like, I think it's really cool as anything. It's, you know, I, I love jazz, too. There was a really great uh, jazz station in New York that I used to listen to all the time. And uh, I got to see, like, uh, you know, Elvin Jones and, and, and uh, Charles Mingus. And, um, and and there was a when I lived in when I lived in West Patterson, 
there was a club down the street, it was right across the street from the Passaic River. It was underneath this Route 80 bridge called Gulliver's. And it was a hugely famous jazz club uh, for New Yorkers. So like on, on, on nights when they had somebody playing, like Thad Jones or somebody, Thad Jones used to teach up at Montclair State University in Jersey. And he would play, and it would be, the place would be parked cars everywhere, all New York plates. All these people drove in from the city. It was, you know, we were like 10 miles outside of New York. But they drove into this place and they had jazz here. It was just this little, you know, tavern. And it was right. tiny inside, you know, and uh, and they had yeah, live yeah, jazz. Yeah. It was incredible. Yeah, absolutely it, incredible. Yeah, that that oh, I just love it. So I'm wondering if you have any cool stories that you want to share or a cool story that you want to share about all your time you hung out with Rod. Okay. And you played for him for a long time. I did. Yes. And so I'm thinking that you probably have something that's cute or funny or neat or that you want to share. And if not, that's okay. But I was just, Oh no, no, I do. I do. I do. And, and they're not, they're nothing, uh, off, uh, right. taste, you know, things that are, are not tasteful and stuff. I mean, there's those, but I'm not going to talk about those. I'll talk about the, the, the crazy stuff. So we were, we were playing, this was when I first joined. I think it was like, I, I was about a year and we were playing in, uh, it was Massachusetts. Anyway, outdoor venue, amphitheater, you know, and uh, our stage set was this big metal set that had, uh, you know, I was on a platform, drummers on a platform, horn section was on a platform. And all around us were these steel ramps that went up, you know, so he would run, you know, up these ramps and behind us and down and stuff like that. And he was nuts. You know, his performance, at, you know, he would right. do these weird things, you know, just out of nowhere. He'd like lay down on the <laughs> stage and just, you know, like after, you know, he was running around or something like that. And, uh, and we're, you know, it's, but it, the thing was, we always had to watch him because it was, uh, you know, things he would change arrangements every night and stuff like that. So it really kept you on your toes. So anyway, we're, we're playing and uh, he runs up this ramp next to me, but <laughs> we had these lights, these moving lights that would like, they were like big octopuses and they came down just enough for him to run ram right into it on his head. Oh no. And he's out cold. So we don't see it because it's happened behind us. The audience has seen this and he's knocked out cold. We think he's just doing what he always does. You know, he's laying down. <laughs> and we're, playing, no. we're playing and then we're like, isn't he supposed to be singing now? You know, and we, and we look and he's still laying down and you get that, you know, you get to that point where you're like, Oh no, this is not, <laughs> he's not just faking this. He's out. So he's out. Now in the front row, uh, is this, uh, this doctor comes running up and he says, you know, let me fix him up. He's, he was Mike Tyson's ringside doctor, right? So he knows how to fix somebody up who's knocked out. So they get him and he's like, fix, stitches him up, gets his mold on. He finished the rest of the show. So it was. <laughs> oh my word! Yeah, yeah. Oh it, my Yodi word! got a really good night that night. That was uh, that was insane. Oh my word! But uh, you know, he was he would do the craziest stuff on stage, and and it's that British sense of humor. You yes. know, that it's really like uh, he would do this ballad. I forget what song it was, where he's singing, and he's like up front of the stage, and he would have one of the. Stay one of the uh, guys on our crew come across the stage with a broom, you know, and just like a big and just sweep across the stage while he's singing every night. And the audience, it's that kind of weird English kind of humor, you right, know. Right. And he had this, uh, he had a song that was a huge hit all around the world, except for the States. A lot of his songs, like in the UK and Europe and South America, that were big hits there, weren't hits here. And the ones that were his here weren't hits there. Like Maggie May was not that big, you know, not his biggest song over there. It was a song called Sailing, or I don't want to talk I about it. The song Sailing. <laughs> we already finished the show that night and we had the screen behind us where, you know, they put stuff up and everything like that. So he wanted to, we're doing Sailing and at the end of it, he puts up a scene from the, uh, the old movie, the old black and white movie, A Night to Remember which is about the sinking of the Titanic. <laughs> so he's got the boat sinking down and this, uh, you know, as we're doing this song, <laughs> stuff like that, just, uh, I was just, you know, it's, it's, it's so genius. It's, it's just, you know, it's so funny. And, but a lot of people didn't get it, but I, you know, we all loved it, you know, the things he would do. So, like I said, he would have no, uh, you know, 
no shame. And I learned that from him. I learned that, you know, it's, it's like you can go up there and not be uptight and kind of like, you know, you got to lose it for me. I lost a lot of my self-consciousness and stuff like that. So I, I was, I would try to kind of go into doing things like that. Like there was, uh, uh, I learned on the road, I picked up a musical saw and I learned how to play a musical saw. It took me about two or three weeks. You know, it's not easy to do. For bed, people don't know what a musical saw is. It's like a regular saw right. that has a hand. You hold the top of it and you bend it and you use a violin bow. Right. I've seen people it. do it. You're right. And you get that sound out of it. And so I said, I'm going to, I'm going to play this in a song, you know? Oh, and uh, wow. so I told the crew, I said, set up a microphone for me. I think it was like on tonight's the night or so. I said, I'm going to, I'm going to sit down and play this. Right. So I did, you know, I <laughs> sat down in a playing his bow. Now, Rod is the kind of guy, he will not give you the satisfaction of giving you a reaction, you know? So it's kind of, well, you can do these things and he can look at you and just like nothing, you know? And that's his thing of like, you're not going to get a rise out of me, you know? And uh, I love it. so, yeah, so there was another, another night that, um, um, let me, let, you know, I told you about sharing a picture. So yes, this yes. is, uh, let, me, let me see if I can do this. Let me get this up first. Cause this goes along with the story. So there were nights where I, I would, you know, I would definitely try to get the rise out of them. Drew loved it. You know, they were just, you know, dying and everything. I would do that like once every 10 shows or something, you know, and it was just, so that's like the character of uh, going up there and doing those things that are just uh, pretty, you know, uh, they're funny, you know, you're on the road, you're just trying to amuse yourself. And, and, you know, we're still real professional and all that, but there was, <laughs> it was one night where the guys, so I would do the, the guys in the, in the band were in the dressing room. They dare me. They said, uh, we bet that you would not go up there and wear, uh, we had three girl background singers. And at the time we were all wearing whatever we wanted to wear. He says, we bet you like $300 you win, or a hundred dollars. We won't, that you won't grab, one of their outfits and wear it on stage during the show. And I said, Oh no. Hey, I was in a glam band for, you know, I used to do that every night. So I went, to one of the, I went in the locker, uh, the wardrobe case that picked out one of the girl's outfits. She was tall and it was like a bright orange jumpsuit. So I put the thing on and I go on and I play the whole show like that, you know, and there again, no reaction, you know, he's not going to give me the satisfaction. And I'm like, but anyway, I was, well, I did it. So at the end of the night, as they're tearing down and, you know, it's backstage with, you know, like an arena. So there's that, that whole truck loading area and, and Rods is leaving in his limousine. And uh, so he's driving out and I'm waving to him. All of a sudden the window comes rolling down. He's like, Chuck, Chuck, come here. He goes, I really loved what you had on tonight. Was that like a Versace or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. It, you know, it could have been a TV show. I was trying to, I'm trying to write a TV show with my son, Noah, on the things that like that would happen. You know, it was uh, another one was we were playing. Tell me if I'm going too long on these. We were playing this. Um, we played in the round, which is the stage in the middle. Right. And we, we were playing stadiums in the, in the UK, uh, big football stadium. So you're in the round and you have like these four, kind of towers that go up where they can hang the lights, you know, but you're in the round. So, which means that when we come out, the band, we have to walk through the, the audience to get to the stage, you know? Right. And, and that's fine. You know, people knew we were the band, but you know, we, that's not what they came to see. They were, so how do you get Rod out there? You, you know, you're going to walk them out on stage. So what they did was they put them in like a big speaker box, like a piece, looks like a piece of equipment and ro <laughs> roll them out. Them out roll them out with him inside to the stage. Right. So they're rolling them out one night and uh, they, th some reason the way it was set up, they got lost. They couldn't get to the stage the way the things were, or else they were like, like they had stuff on the ground. They couldn't move 10 minutes. They're going around. He's inside like banging. What's going, you know, trying oh to get, God, you know, like, you know, like, like not be able to breathe in there. So, you know, just things like that, which are just, you know, it's kind of oh. like multi towers or something, you know? <laughs> oh my God. That's hysterical. Well, there's a whole bunch of other things I want to ask you. So yeah. I'm going to have oh. to ask you back for a second interview because oh. I'm running, we're running out of showtime. 
Okay. Um, but I have two questions I want to ask yes. you before we're done today. One, what's the most memorable food you've ever eaten on all of your travels all over the place? What's the most memorable food? Well, two places. There's Boule in New York City, uh, you know, the taster's menu. And that guy's like world famous chef and stuff. The other, which I really, because whenever we go to England, UK, I go for Indian because it's the best Indian in the world. Uh, London or, you know, basically anywhere in the UK, but I found a place that does Nouvelle Indian, which was nuts. Mm -hmm. I've never had, I've never seen it, never heard of it. And it was absolutely stellar. And they do a taster's menu. There's in South Kensington, across from Kensington Gardens. And uh, I would, you know, wait for that place to open up to go in and, and get food there. And it was like, I've never seen anything mm -hmm. like that Nouvelle Indian. So Ooh. that was probably it, you know, that to me sticks. <laughs> that sounds really, really cool. Well, we're going to, I'm going to ask you to come back on the show because I want to talk to you okay. about, about being a father with your sons and, and some other things, challenges you've been through and all of those things. So thank you for saying yes. Oh, yes. yes. So your final question for today's show is that we're going to put a billboard up with your message on it for the world, for the whole world to see. Chuck Kentis' message. What is your message for the world? Let's see. You know, I... I for me, life is kind of about obser observation, you know, taking things in and stuff. I'm, I'm the same as you. I'm introverted. So I'm not, I'm not, you know, out there talking all the time. So, so most of the, you know, and people think that, you know, cause I'm quiet, they maybe I'm stuck up or something like that. I'm like, no, that's just my nature. I'm just quiet. I'm not right, like right. a yacker kind of guy. Although, you know, this interview probably proves something different maybe. <laughs> But uh, uh, wait, I just got you. I just kickstarted some fun conversation. That's all I did. I <laughs> love it. But but anyway, so I would probably put up something like uh, look, listen and love. You know, oh, I love it. And, and you know, because that's for me was like, you know, I, I, that's how I learned about things, you know, and, and, and you know, sometimes I have to stop myself from. uh if somebody's having a, if we're having a conversation, I'm listening to somebody, you know, like you were, mm -hmm. and not to jump in there with my, you know, blah, 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 uh, and just listen and, and, and look and, and, uh, and then love, you know, it's kind of like those, those three things for me, you know, it's important to mm -hmm. converse and everything like that. But a lot of times I, I do that through music. That's, that's my expression. You know, it's not always, it's not what I say. It's kind of what I, what I, what I play or what I write. Right. Oh, I know. It's beautiful. Well, I want to thank you for all your time and all your cool stories. There is so much more that I want to cover. It is not funny. Oh, I look forward to coming back. It was very nice. Sorry we ran out of time. My blabbing away there. But uh, uh, this, I hope this, you know, I love this show. I think what you're doing is fantastic. I've seen, I've seen other parts of it. And I congratulate you and give you kudos for, for, for you know, help, you know, what you're doing for, uh, for people. You know, I think it's great. Oh, thank you, Chuck. I, that means a lot to me. And thank you for being on the show. And so if you guys are half as inspired as me, in the show notes, you will find all the ways to follow Chuck. Because I have hunted him down on YouTube and everywhere else, and I watch everything. And it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And I'm very picky. So thank you for being on the show with me today, Chuck. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And remember, keep your face to the sun so the shadows fall behind you because you're a rock star. You're here on purpose with a purpose. So go out there and learn and love and listen and laugh. We can do lots of L words and know that you're here by divine right. So till the next episode, be well. Thank you for listening. I trust you gained some valuable inspiration and information. Please join me and other visionaries in the Someone Gets Me Facebook group. Or for more information on my services and additional episodes, visit someonegetsme.com. Again, thanks for listening.